Let's see. Someone, someone message cut loud and clear. We are good. Awesome. So, well, Tim, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you're here. And also, we've got Mike Parenta here in the back. He will be the AV uh, genius showing some, some videos and some pictures and uh, things like that. But Tim, we, we're going to have 2,000 salespeople on this morning. Um, we've got a lot of other corporate people joining us. And so it should be a really, really, really fun uh, meeting. But we did 110,000 accounts in the Yeah, so I believe that's a record for like a service company ever. Like, I don't know anyone that's adding 110,000 in a month. And so we are, um, we're blessed and we want to give back. We want to be better. We want to do more. And just so everyone knows, I was first introduced to Tim and Operation Underground Railroad, I don't know, eight or nine months ago. And ever since that introduction, it's been, it's consumed me more or less. And a um, little bit about what they do is they, they fight, you know, human trafficking. And the reason why we wanted to support uh, op or organizations like Operation Underground Railroad and the Nazarene Fund and others uh, is because it's 4th of July weekend and that's all about liberty. So let's kind of start there. What is the 4th of July freedom and liberty in our country's history mean to you, Tim? Well, you know, I love history. You know that I've written several books and that I, history is my inspiration behind our strategies, behind uh, why we do what we do. And when you consider what freedom is, the better question is what is, what is, what are you going to do with it? Uh, only I, it's, it's like a, a fourth or less of the world's populations over the entire span of, of Earth's life have lived in a place or a time when they enjoyed freedom um, outside of a tyrannical government that, that wants to take it down. So that, that's, that's the, you know, that's, that's the rule. The rule is tyranny, tyranny. Yeah. And so we're lucky to be free. What are we going to do with the freedom? Um, I love the 19th century and, 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 and learning about the transatlantic slave trade, what, what these liberated slaves did with their freedom, like Harriet Tubman. You know, she becomes free. And right away, she's like, what am I going to do with this? Right? And she takes it. She could have done anything. She could have gone and started her own business. She could have gone and, and uh, uh, lived, lived a life of freedom and just built whatever she wanted to do. Have fun. Right? Most people's mentality, I think, in the world is, how can I make my life more comfortable? How can I have more fun? Right? right? That's mostly what drives us, but that's, that's unfulfilling. She, she, Harriet Tubman will tell you that's unfulfilling. So what she did was like, well, I can't just enjoy this. And so she went back into the South, a fugitive slave. Had she wow. been caught, she would have been just So destroyed. she was free. She was and free. And then she goes back. She goes back in multiple times, uh, rescues dozens of, of, of slaves, undercover operations, some of which we actually, again, we, we've patterned some of our, how we operate like she does. Um, that's why we call ourselves Operation Underground Railroad. Um, anyway, so, so that's what it is. If the question to us is what, what are we doing with this freedom? How are we going to use it? What are we going to stand and fight for? Uh, I get so frustrated when I see what, um, the media is, decides to spend its time talking about what people, you know, get all upset over and, 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 and march and protest. And, uh, you know, I remember Particularly, and again, I'm not I'm not anti climate change at all. Right? I, I'm not really that's not my expertise, right? But I do know enough to know that hundreds of thousands have mobilized over the year, parades, marches, march on Washington, this and that. And I'm I'm pretty certain that there's no documented deaths or rapes of children or even of adults due to climate change. Yeah, but I do know that. Not 10 or 20 or even 10,000 or 20,000, millions of children every year are raped, killed, organs cut out of their bodies. Millions. The fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world is the selling of people. 
Not one march, not one headline ever. Um, I mean, Jeffrey Epstein, that we got some headlines on that. Which yesterday. Is like, yeah, yesterday, and then when he was, you know, he went through it. So we're, you know, at least someone's talking a little bit, and hopefully that can grow. But where is the outrage? And so the question, and so Fourth of July, as we celebrate, let's get let's get outrage over something that's 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 like so legit that we can all come around and decide to use our freedom in a way that's going to benefit those who are seriously in, in, in danger, children. Now, the, the country is <clears throat> fiercely divided right now. Um, it's al it almost feels like there's nothing that we can agree on. But you opened my eyes to, to something that we can agree on. Ex explain, explain that. Yeah, so, it's, so <laughs> it was funny. I, a couple of years ago, I got a call from Mike Tomlin the head coach of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yep. And I was just, I thought, well, there's no way this guy's really calling us. Uh, he invited me out to Steelers summer camp. So we went out to Latrobe, uh, Pennsylvania. And, and I thought we were there just because he wanted to get his guys involved in trafficking, anti-trafficking. And he, he grabs me the first day. He's like, can we have dinner alone? I, I need to, in his words, I need to tell you a dirty little secret, is what he said. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> like, is, is, is Roethlisberger like, trafficking kids or something like he's gonna i'm investigating his team you know, like, <laughs> i was thinking all sorts of crazy things he sits me down and, and, and ben is not of course he's, he's actually one of the coolest dudes right, he's, right. He's great support to who you are i'm just joking but we, we sat down i sat down with mike and he says look i don't want you to get the wrong idea i want to rescue kids there's nothing more valuable more important than that he said but we are the nfl is in a is in a we're kind of a microcosm of the nation in whole, in whole, right? And, and look at the divisiveness. It's everywhere, this whole thing. This was during the whole kneeling, and the, the Kaepernick stuff. And, and he's just like, I am so tired of this divisiveness. And it, he said, it occurred to me that there may be only one thing left. One thing left, that left and right and crosses, transcends racial divides or political divides. And it's a sad commentary that there's only one thing left. But it's true, there may be only one thing left that everybody agrees on, and that's children shouldn't be kidnapped, trafficked, raped. They certainly shouldn't have their hearts ripped out of their bodies and sold on the black market. And, and yet that is what's going on, that is what's happening. So uh, it's, it, is, it is the last, it is the last cause. And so more than rescuing kids, which there's nothing more important than that, it really can be a unifying issue. Just like the Underground Railroad during the 19th century, right? I mean, think about that. There's no more divisive time um, than, than that time period. And yet, people of all races, black and white and German and Mexican and every nationality, they put aside their prejudices and said, we've got to stop human bondage. And that was the Underground Railroad. So there's a model for this. And uh, we just need people to get loud about this. Um, because not only does it rescue kids, it heals nations. Now... We're going to get more into um, rescuing kids, but you, you're as you as you mentioned, you're you're an author. You've written several books, I believe, at least four. Um, but Tim didn't ask me to do this. This is not an advertisement for Tim, but this is his most uh, recent book. It's the the Pilgrim Hypothesis. Uh, through your studies, though, uh, just briefly talk to us a little bit about how Washington was able to do what he did. I mean, you're talking, like his, his army was like farmers, right? Going up against the equivalent of what, like Navy SEALs? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Lincoln, what he did, I mean, how, how did they, how did they actually change something? How was that movement created? Yeah, so what they did, it's interesting, in all my books I write about the same topic. Uh, the word I use is covenant. Uh, they believed that America was a promised land. Uh, and they, the founders patterned the promised land after the, the, the ancient Israelite, the Old Testament nation that built one nation under God. And we can verify this. I mean, the, the, the vast majority of, of the sources quoted in the building of the nation was the Old Testament. Um, and so they were trying to re recreate that, which means it's an if-then kind of statement. If you are righteous in the land, if you do good, then heaven will bless you. And that's how you build one nation under God. There's no other possible way George Washington, who's a very deliberate, intelligent guy, 
would have thought he could have bested the world superpower with a bunch of citizen soldiers and farmers, like you pointed out. Uh, but he was constantly, and I write in my books about this, constantly saying, if we're righteous, God will bless us. And so what does that mean? What's, what is, uh, how do you become righteous? Well, Washington gave suggestions to the nation. You know, be moral, be faithful to, to each other, uh, forgive, repent. It gets more um, defining, I think, during Lincoln's time. Lincoln uh, discovered the same truth about 1862, 1863. He became aware of this covenant. Uh, he didn't know much about it before, but he, he was humbled enough through the war. And he starts doing the same thing, invokes it in powerful ways. You just saw last night with the Glenn Beck program we did. Right. And the, the, the program cut, we got to watch the end, but where the kids at the end read Lincoln's speech. And he's, he just he's flat out says it. Same thing. God will bless us only for righteous. Well, what does righteousness mean? First and, well, first and foremost, service. Serve one another. Stop hating on each other. Serve one another. And in Lincoln's words, the best way to do that is liberate the captive. Liberate slaves. So full circle back to Mike Tomlin and what we're talking about. Here we are again at a time when the nation needs healing. It needs the covenant. Well, what's the call to action? How do we invoke the blessings of heaven down upon our land? Well, you can start by saving God's children that are being abused by the millions. There's only one time in the scriptures, I don't mean to get too, you know, Sunday school here, but there's only one time in the scriptures that where, that where, where the Lord gets like mafioso kind of violent in his words. I mean, we take it for granted, but he says, if you hurt one of these little children, better that a millstone be wrapped around your neck and you tossed into the sea, that's mafia stuff. Yeah. Like we're gonna we're gonna cement shoe you and throw you into the in the Hudson, right? I mean that's what God says. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're gonna do to you. So we, he he leaves he leaves no room to interpret what he thinks about his children being abused. So it makes sense. Like you want heaven's favor, you want some healing back into your own heart and, and into the nation and the world. We can start by rescuing children who are being severely abused. That's amazing, and and that's. What what Tim just alluded to, I thought, what a great opportunity for us as a company, 2,000 people, to unite, to get behind something, to maybe get whatever you call it, whether it's heaven or energy or power, to get that behind us for a day and see what good we can do. So I want to kind of back up and, and get into more of some of the details of maybe some of the operations. Sure. That you've been part of and, and how you got into this. So where I was where I was moved um, to to a point where I it's become kind of like an obsession is this story about a little boy named Gardy. Yeah, crazy story. So I was I was a government agent and um, working in child crimes. I was an undercover operator. Uh, my job was to infiltrate networks that that abuse children. So I speak Spanish, so they sent me to play the role of a pedophile or a trafficker or whatever I needed to do, mostly in foreign countries, in order to find American children, American pedophiles, travelers who are hurting kids. And um, I come across this case. I, I got transferred. I was on the border for most of my career. I got transferred to the Salt Lake office and to help them start a child crimes unit. And I was only here for like a year when I come across this case of a little boy from Utah, born in Utah, of Haitian descent and Gardy Marty, this little kid right here. Born in St. George, Utah, moved back with his family to Port-au-Prince, his father serving as a, as a bishop in the LDS church in Port-au-Prince. And one day at church, this is Father Gessner, at church. I mean, it's, it's the most horrifying story, the, the, the greatest parental nightmare you can dream of. He said that all day at church that day, his son usually loves to go to the little the, 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 the children's Sunday school class. And he's three years, he's three years old, so he goes to what's the nursery, they call it the nursery, right? The little kids where they take care of the kids. He wouldn't go that day. He held on to his dad and just held onto his neck and, and he he's like trying to he wouldn't go. I was like, what's wrong with you? All day. Kids have, you know, they have intuitions. And he just was holding him, holding him. Finally, the meeting ends, the, 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 the congregation. And yes, no, the father, he needs to do some work, some business. So he tells a little bit of the three-year-old. I have mean, a three-year-old right now, so this just breaks my heart. But I can see this. And, you know, go, go back, go down and go to mom. Mom's right down there. And so he listens and he starts to go. 
That's the last time they ever see him. Kidnappers have been in the meeting planning this for weeks. They intercepted the kid right then, walked him outside, took his hand, walked him outside, a motorcycle was waiting, threw him on the motorcycle, gone. And the idea was a ransom. It was going to be a ransom deal, right? So um, it was actually one of the congregants who was part of it, who, who, who guest got fired in his business, but still encouraged him to come to church. He has embezzling money. Yeah. So he thinks, I'm just going to do this. He'll be away for one day. We'll ransom him off. I know he's got the money. And I'll get my money back. He'll get the kid back. Well, the guys, the thugs he partnered with used him as the fall guy, got the ransom money, and then decided, why, why give the kid back? It can sell him on the black market. It can sell him for, for a variety of things. And that's where he disappears. And I find out about this case, and I'm just dying inside because I, having worked internationally, I know that in most developing countries, especially Haiti, they don't do proactive investigations. No one's doing anything to find this kid. And what really broke my heart was when I, I finally brought Gessler, the father, up to my office in Salt Lake. And I said, well, what's being done to find your son? And he throws this question out that's haunted me since the moment he spoke the words. And it shook on all of us. I said, what's being done to find your son? And he said to me, he asked me a question that I wasn't expecting. He said, do you have children? And I said, yes. He said, could you imagine walking into your kid's room, seeing an empty bed, and I, if you don't have kids, I pose this question to you. Your nephew, your niece, your little brother, right, whatever. And seeing that bed empty and not knowing where that child is, could you sleep at night? And I was like, no, absolutely. There's no way. He's like, well, because I can't sleep, because the police aren't doing anything. He said, I literally walked the streets of Port-au-Prince, flashlight in hand, arbitrarily picking some neighborhood. The darker, the better. The more crime ridden the better. And I pray to God that I'll hear my son cry. So I'm just, I'm a mess. I'm just bawling. I'm like, wow, I didn't expect that answer. And, and then I committed to him right then. Because here's the thing, I knew enough to know that I could take that pain in his eyes and multiply it by 10 million children, 20 million parents, right? 100 million family members suffering this in the world right now. And we go about our lives and don't even think about it. That's, that's the sad part. And so I committed to him right then. I said, I, I promise you, I will never, ever stop until we find your son. Well, the problem with my promise, I thought I had a jurisdictional uh, you know, justification to be in there because the boy was from, born in the U.S. Turns out- Because you're with Homeland Security. I'm with Homeland Security. Turns out the legal suits above me decided I didn't have that authority. It was a Haitian crime committed by Haitians and I was to stand down. So I'm like, now what? I was doing the same thing. We won't get into this necessarily, but I had made the same promise in Colombia on another case, which you've seen the movie Sound of Freedom that tells that story. So I did it twice right at the same time. This is 2013. And both times I went too far. I got myself into it, an investigation, made myself the bait in an undercover situation where if I walked away, the case would fold. And so that, I was like, what do we do? So I went to my wife, like, what do we do? And my wife was just like, it was so easy. Like, you, you quit your job. If you can't work this, you quit your job. We'll go about it privately. And I was like, are you insane? <laughs> like, we have six kids. You know, we don't have savings enough to last a couple months. Like, she like, it doesn't matter. Pension's right there. I lost my pension. I, I, I would have had it in a, in a little bit, but I lost it. And, and uh, it was just the right thing to do. It was just like, we're going to do it. It doesn't matter. Uh, so, so we quit. And I got Glenn Bent to raise a little money for us. And off we went to do those two operations, one in Haiti, one in Colombia. And we didn't really know what was gonna happen after that. It wasn't about after that. It was just, God will take care of us later. Right now, I just gotta focus on these two cases and get them done. Yeah. So we ended up going into the, we found the captors in Haiti, we worked with the police. We pulled all the stops out, had drones, undercover cameras, went undercover into the place where the captors lived. and. When we got in there, we, we saw that there was 28 other children in there where Gardy had been or we believed he would be. It was a false orphanage. Uh, and this false orphanage, that's how traffickers work. Like after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010 or after a hurricane, traffickers just gravitate to that place, right? Whatever place it is, in this case, Haiti. And they throw signs over the walls, orphanage. 
And then decent people, there's, there's in, the, in 2010, there was about a half a million orphans made instantly, dead parents, including two, a little baby, one, two years old, walking the streets. A, a, a woman comes in. I mean, look at it. I mean, see this destruction, right? This, this older woman takes, takes these two children and says, I can't help you, but there's an orphanage. Why? Because it says orphanage. Drops them off. And... Drop, drops them off. And those two kids end up being, being given to the, the very captors who captured and kidnapped Guardi. So I'm tra we're tracking Guardi. We end up into this false orphanage, right. and I meet those two kids there. In fact, those are the two kids that I happened to uh, buy in a sting operation because we, were, we had to get the evidence that these people were selling kids. So we actually let them off for children to us, hidden cameras right all over. So we're catching all the evidence. And they think we're, uh, we don't work for the police, but look at us. Right? Right. We're American trappers. The United States, we're the number one demand. So we're the clientele the traffickers internationally are looking for. So we go in and, and do this sting operation, these two beautiful children that I end up, I, I picked, I, I was about to pick a kid. I didn't care. I didn't matter. Right? It shouldn't matter. Just whatever kid. Just you grab one. Yeah. <laughs> but this little boy, and you've seen the footage. I don't know if you can actually see it right here. This is the actual footage picked up from the undercover camera of my colleague. And I'm looking, right now looking to buy a kid. This kid walks up to me. And it starts calling me Papa, Papa Blanc, white daddy. And I'm like, what's going on? So I, I take these kids and, and this little girl is following me around as I'm holding this boy. And I find out that she's the, she's the she's older sister. And she's like, is she staring me down? Like, she, how many Americans have come to this place and picked up a kid and that kid disappears forever? And this little girl's like, I'm not gonna let that happen. So this is her right here. I remember that big dash over her eye that day. And I was like, this brave little kid, you know, and I gave her a candy bar. I said, get out of here. You know, you, know. you don't want the extra attention. Right. And, and I gave her this candy bar. And instead of doing what my kids do, which is great, I got a candy bar, just got to go outside. She didn't budge. She took it. She broke it in half and, and placed the other half of the bar into the hands of the little boys in my arms. And that's when it hit me. Oh my gosh, what have I done? So this is his sister. So I put, I put both the kids down. I grab both their hands. We're alone in, in one of these outbuildings. I have my, my colleague, my undercover operator is with me. He's over negotiating the price of this little boy. And I tell these kids who I am, that I'm not a, I'm not a bad guy and I promise they'll never be a part again. So we end up buying both the kids just to keep them together right. because the deal's going to go down somewhere else in another, in another hotel room near the orphanage. So, so we do the deal. This is us doing the deal, the actual... Andrew's actually watching, by the way. What? Andrew's actually on this broadcast. Oh, hey, Andrew Tyson. <laughs> so the guy I'm talking about is, 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 is actually listening right now. That's him right there. Um, the backwards hat. So Andrew, Andrew speaks uh, Creole. It's hard to find Creole speakers who, are also, who also are smart and, and analytical yeah. and brave enough. And Andrew fit all of those. So he was, he, he was my comrade in arms on this one. So we, we do the deal. The, everyone goes down. It's a beautiful deal. Everyone gets arrested. Uh, the kids get liberated from the. That's me getting arrested. I, I, I've been arrested in about a dozen or more countries over, over my. I always get to leave though. Um, we, of course, we do that to keep our cover. Um, uh, so everyone gets arrested. The kids get liberated. Did you see that note to the panelists? What was that? Uh, just check the notes on from the panels. They're saying a couple of things. Anyway, okay. keep going. So, um, so, uh, so anyway, it's just it's like this great day, and now we don't know. We hope Guardy's here at this place. We we don't know because twenty eight kids. We didn't have a lot of time in there, right? So we're waiting and waiting and waiting, and then we get the word that we've gone through every kid dozens of times. Guardy's not here. We believe he was here, but he was sold already. So you've got to go talk to Guardy's dad, guess no, and tell him, no, Guardy, tell us about that experience. Yes, yeah, like the greatest and worst right. conversation of my life. He's waiting in the hotel room, and we just knew that I would walk into that hotel room with his son. Walk in there, and um, he sees me. And doesn't even say, I don't need to say anything. He can tell. His body language. Yeah, and he just starts to cry. And I start to cry. And we're sitting like toe to toe in this hotel restaurant. And 
and I eke out, I do get the words out, but we did rescue 28 kids. And he, this, this picture actually is from a, another operation. <sighs> this is from another operation where we had a lead on his son and we went out. Um, I can't reveal exactly where we were, but we went out to look for him. We were, we, we thought we had him. This is us. This is me going back into the car again, a second time, telling him we were close, but we missed him again. Um, just, it's just, it's the most heartbreaking thing, right? But what's crazy, and I'll get back to Gessler's response in a second, but Gessler eventually says to me after this, he says, you know what, Tim, I'm realizing something. If Gardy hadn't been taken, well, he said the same thing to me in the restaurant. Okay, I'll go back there. He repeated it again and got more detailed with me here. But every time we come to these crossroads where it's this guard, you know, we don't get Gardy. Instead of getting bitter and you know, cursing God, Gessler says the same thing to me, just like he said in this on this talk in the hotel. He said, Stop being upset. You just told me we rescued 28 kids. I said, Yeah, but I'm worried about the one we didn't rescue. He says, No, you're missing the point. If Gardy hadn't been kidnapped, your team wouldn't have come here. No one would have come here. And these 28 kids would be sold to pedophiles, to traffickers, to organ harvesters, for slave labor. Uh, but because Gardy was kidnapped, they were saved. And he said, if I have to lose my son so that these 28 kids can be rescued, that is a burden I'm willing to bear for my entire life. And I remember thinking, and I still think it now, I wish, had roles been reversed, I truly don't think I could say that. Because I, I, I picture my children, I don't think I can say it. I wish I could, because it's, it's like the most godly thing to say. The next day he goes to the orphan, he goes to the cops and says, I will take home any of these children. If you can't find their parents, I will be their father. These children who were rescued in the name of my son. He went home with eight kids that day. So then we don't give up, right? We move on to the next operation and the next operation. By the way, I, I end up adopting those two kids that because I thought, if you can take eight, we can take two, right? Again, it was my wife, not me, because I wouldn't, I would have been too scared to do that too. But uh, those kids have been home now for two years and they've just been awesome. Would you mind uh, letting the group see the video of the reunion of the two oh, kids yeah. with, your, with your family? Yeah, it's, 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 if you don't mind seeing me cry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just too powerful not to share. And, and, and despite so much darkness, this is one of the happy stories. Yeah. And I, I feel like, oh, we should show it to the team. So. Um, you know what? It's actually, we may not be able to do it because we're not, you're not hooked up through, uh, this computer so i don't know that the sound is going to uh, is going to i'll put a link work. to it i'll put a link to it in the comments awesome yeah put a link to it that would be amazing then people can watch it watch it after so uh tim why don't we also talk about uh columbia as well so you said you said there were two kind of two missions where you had made some promises but you couldn't necessarily keep them as a member of homeland security which forced you to walk away yeah. from your job. So I think you named this one Triple Take, right? Operation Triple Take, yeah. yeah. So this was, this was simultaneously happening. Like 2014 was a crazy year for us because we didn't have a lot of money. Right. So I, I was literally just like <laughs> hopping back and forth between Haiti and Columbia, Haiti and Columbia, trying to get to this, do these cases. And um, you know, again, these cases I couldn't, comp I couldn't do, I couldn't finish as an agent. The Columbia one was nuts. Columbia is one of the highest trafficking countries. And we had a lead on an investigation there that we wanted to dig into. And as I said earlier, I, I was given permission to do some like a little consulting, like <laughs> some training, some training. Yeah. Instead, I, I realized they needed me to be the undercover operator because not because I'm so great at it, but because the demand is the United States. We are the highest consumers of child rape videos and child sex in the world. We're in the top three for destination countries. This is a newer development. Travelers wanting to get kids into the United States. 
in order to um, get them into our black markets and into our pedophiles' hands. So they said, Tim, we can't infiltrate. You can infiltrate. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. I, I knew I shouldn't have policy wise, but I did. So I got myself deep into this. And then when I realized, I came to a point where I realized I, I, I can't, I, I don't, they're not going to give me permission to do this. There's no US kids involved with this. And so uh, I had to walk away from that case, I, having promised that I would stay. Well, I ended up going back, you know, because when I quit my job, so I was free. And we, dug deeper and deeper and deeper into this investigation, uncovered crazy stuff, like how these kids get trafficked. Um, one of the main traffickers in this organization that we infiltrated was a woman named Kelly Suarez, who was Miss Cartagena in 2013, or 2012 maybe, but she was Miss Cartagena, She's beautiful, 20, 24, 25 years old. Um, and she won a Miss Cartagena pageant on the platform that she's going to help the impoverished children. Hey, look, she's, I mean, she looks like a trafficker. Do you? No. That's, what's so, that's why she's the most frightening trafficker. So she's, she's saying she's going to, uh, you know, help impoverished children in Haiti, or I'm sorry, in Colombia. And by all appearances, she was because she was giving scholarships to her modeling school, targeting kids at nine or 10 years old. And then once she had the kids, Groom them. They, they groom them through desensitizing them, showing them pornography, giving them drugs, and then eventually saying, "Look, you want to be famous like me? Go in there and do what you just saw in this video. Do it to that American man in the other room." So we infiltrate this group, and um, they end up bringing uh, over fifty kids to this island party. They believe they're going to partner with us to build a sex hotel. And they're, they're showing us the talent that they all have. It was a trap, you know, against them. It was the only way we could get all the kids, that we could get round them all up. In fact, we, we were telling them, look, you got to bring your competitors in. Because we weren't, we're not going to help you build a, a hotel, a sex hotel, unless you have lots of talent. Right. So that caused them to call you all, all their competitors. So all the child traffickers came to the meeting. Um, and it's, it's kind of like that movie, is it Clear and Present Danger? When they, they get all the, they get all the drug traffickers into the same place. Right, so right. they can take them all out. That's kind of what we do. We got all the traffickers um, in, in one place uh, with all the kids. Uh, and then in the end, it was way bigger than this even. It just continued getting bigger. You've seen the documentary. Right. There's a documentary that hasn't come out yet that just killer documentary explains on it. But we ended up rescuing over 120 victims in, in about an hour. That is crazy. And so that was that was the beginning of, of OUR and, and you know those those operations are what allowed us to live another day, you know. So so because and Mike can they can they see us or do they see your logo right now? They see they see us they right see now. you yeah okay. you see the logo because perfect it's yours yeah so because you went and you went to Colombia because you went and searched for Gardi. What has OUR and the Nazarene Fund and, and other organizations that we're going to support today? What's what's happened since? What's it grown to? Well, what's crazy? So yeah, I mean, even just in Haiti alone, you know, like when Gesto says it repeats often, it's like if I have to give up my son to rescue these twenty-eight. Well, there's now over so this last month. In the last two months, we rescued 33 children in Haiti from sex traffickers. 33? 33. 33, through COVID, yeah. We're about to, we're about to give the news on, on a video. We're going to launch it by next week. Um, that took us over 500 kids. 500 looking for Guardi. Yeah. Uh, because we haven't given up on Guardi. We will find him. We have leads. I can't get into too many details. We will find him. But we've rescued 500 kids, over 500 kids, just on that island alone in Haiti looking for Guardi. But beyond that, what it started, you know, when Gesto says these numbers, I don't guess no, it's over 4,000 <laughs> in 26 countries. Over 4,000 that we've started, you know? Um, so, uh, and, and we're very close. In fact, I just talked to Gesto this morning. He's down in Haiti. We're, we're ramping up investigations in Jagardi still right now. Um, I think this year could be the year, really. Um, but, um, 
so we're yeah we're now we're in 26 countries and doing those same kind of operations all the time every month uh and uh, over 2,000 pedophiles and traffickers are in jail because of our investigations which i love that number because i know statistically one trafficker one pedophile can rape abuse uh you know harvest organs well over 100 kids in a lifetime easily so, so now we're in the tens of thousands of kids hundreds of thousands of right. kids who have in actuality that's right been saved. and those are the best ones to save the ones that never knew they needed rescuing because they were never taken in the first place because there would be captors or locked up yeah. so what what we're going to ask you to all of you to do today um, i think i tim i told you a little bit but we're going to ask you to just donate a sale or two sales or three sales. I want you to just think about for a moment your life, the, the, the trials you have, your struggles, your pressures. Um, also think about like your blessings. Some, some of you are making not a thousand, but thousands per day. <laughs> Some of, some of them are making a thousand dollars before lunch. They're that they are that good. I mean, these are the LeBron James, the Michael Jordans of sales, and this is the greatest sales organization in the world. Far and nobody in the world does what this group does, and we can make a difference. And, and I'm just I'm just asking that all of you donate a sale today because that one sale it'll save it'll save a child. Like I, I know it will. And hundred percent. In fact, let me just say this. I can't give too many details, but um, we're, we're, we're working on an operation. I can't even tell you right now where it is. Um, it's a huge operation. It's, it's going to be one of the biggest we've ever done. Um, Bessie knows the details of what it is, but um, we have located it. I mean, again, you guys understand like millions of kids are stuck in this. And we found an organization that is not only selling children for sex, but for organ harvesting. And we have a very elaborate plan. We've been infiltrating this group for literally years. Different ways to infiltrate. So they don't, you know, there's, there's a lot of areas in this world. You look, at, you look at a world map and you see all the colors. Oh, this country, that country. No. If you, I would, they need to do like a criminal org map of the world. So you see how many pockets in the world are owned by nobody but criminals. Like there's so many countries. Where the criminal, the, the, the police, the government has zero sovereignty. Yeah. It's run by criminal organizations. And somebody needs to do a map one day so you see this. That things are not as clear, you know, black and white as you might think. And that's where the kids are being hurt the worst. Because there's no law. So how do we get in there? We have to be creative. It, we'll, we'll, we'll go in any way that, you know, I really, I'm, I'm even hesitant to say the different tactics we use. Um, but any way that guys that look like us would be in that region, they'd want you there, right? providing some kind of service, providing something for them. Um, so we've been working in this group for a long years, and we're finally at the point where we're going to do extractions. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruffle a lot of feathers. It's going to be dangerous <laughs> um, because it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to light that region up when the, when the world finds out what's happening there. So I'm actually going to, some of the money raised today here will go directly into that operation. And what's cool about it is once it's done, I will come back to this table with pictures, with videos. It's a, it's a rare operation too that once it's done, we, we're going to splatter it. Why? Because um, there's so many kids here. We can't, we can only extract a few. And the, the only way to get the rest is to get out, outrage, like national, international outrage. Then we can force, compel government of the countries to, to do something about the other ones. So usually part of our plan isn't scream to the media right away, this is. But I, I will tell you this, you'll be the first, we'll do the first, we'll do the first one here. That's awesome. Before we go anywhere else, but you guys, I, I, I mean, I can even do it to you on location maybe, we'll do, you know. Live, live yeah, Zoom I'll, in. I'll have you with me <laughs> on the ground and like, the day it happens, we'll do a Zoom from the location and say, this, this just happened. Right. Yeah. Now, everyone, because I know this is what I, I thought, like, and you get this question over and over, and I, I, I just love your answer. Um, 
nobody watching this, the couple thousand people that are watching right now is not thinking, I don't want to do something. Everyone's saying, I want to do something. I want to be an abolitionist. I want to fight. There's no, there, there is no greater cause than, than this. And I genuinely believe this. I would not take 2000 people off. I mean, we sell, we, we sell hundreds of thousands an hour. It's I would not take, <laughs> I would not take hundreds of potentially millions off the table for this meeting if it wasn't that important. So what, what can, what can people do? Like, what is the, the best thing that, that they can, that they can do right now? Oh, right. Listen to the vest and, and contribute. A Outside of the money. Part, Outside yes. of that. <laughs> so we're starting this new program. It's so cool. Yeah. We haven't announced it officially yet um, because we, we want to answer this question for people. Well, the, the first answer I give is this. You'll know before I know. You know your time, your ability. You know before I know what it is you want to do. You had this experience. You know, you, you're, you're very type A proactive. You came to me and said, here's what I want to do. I'm like, awesome, let's do them. And that's the best. Because right. if it's your idea, then it's so much easier. I, I can't really say it. Um, but to facilitate that whole process, we're starting a new program. Um, the name's not official yet, but it's, it's probably going to be something like the Conductor Club. The Conductor on the Underground Railroad was, um, was like Harry Tubman. He was a conductor. Action-based, not just abolitionists, because they're awesome. Any abolitionist who's talking about it, we need that. But the Conductor Club... It's a special group of vetted volunteers, and we have 14,000 right now. We want to have 100,000, and we're organizing it right now to where this conductor club, again, that might not be the name, that's like the working title, sure. but you become a conductor on the Underground Railroad, the modern day on Underground Railroad, where we're giving you assignments, and, and some of it requires travel and, and building things for law enforcement units to help them, especially right now, we're, this is critical, this is scary, scary times. LA County, that's where I'm born and raised, just announced if the, if the city council has their way, the child crimes unit is gone. Under the defund the police. Under defund, this whole, the whole defund the police thing. Um, and so we are like need more than ever because we're going to have to fill, we're going to fill those gaps. Right. Already law enforcement is lacking severely in this, not in will or skill, but in resources. They don't have digital forensic labs. They don't have the digital forensic dogs. All the things that save kids, even the new United States. So our job already, we're, we're in a huge challenge to get the resources they need. And now they're going to defund what they already didn't have to help kids. This is killing me right now. Um, how kids are, don't have a seat at this table right now as this nation's deciding the fate of, of, of our direction. It's, it's really sad. Kids, the kids are being completely ignored. ignored. So uh, more than ever, we need this kind of elite club. Look for it. You can actually sign up as a volunteer right now. Um, you'll see, you can go online right now to OURrescue.org and sign up. Put your skill set in. You take a test. You fill out an application. Like, we vet you. It, it, you're subject to a background investigation and everything. But that's we're building an army, basically, of, of people who are willing to get their hands dirty and, and, and become conductors on the Underground Railroad. So, so here, you, you, go, you go to here, you go join the fight. It's our website, OURrescue.org. When you go there, then you can, um, uh, you see, like, you go back up, Mike. You see there's a volunteer login, so you'll actually get access as a volunteer to information that others don't see. Because we, I mean, we, we vet you, like I said, we, we background check you. It's, it's a process. But now you're, you're, you're on this team. So everybody should be a conductor. I mean, that's... Um, it turns, what, what it turns into really is like in-kind donations. Right. Like instead of writing a check, we'd rather you fly yourself over to Cambodia and provide certain technology that the Cambodian police need that you're going to learn, you're going to train yourself up on, depending on your skill set, right? But we, we need things like occupational therapists, for example. They're, they're signing up and we're sending them to go help these children who are in aftercare, who we've rescued, to, to be, become reintegrated in society. So there's so many skill sets that you people have Web designers. We're sending our web, these web designers out, and they're building like undercover sites in different law, for law enforcement, so they can do sting operations, building honeypots, right, for pedophiles, because cops don't have generally that skill, right? So it's it's amazing what people can do with the skills they have, especially in the tech world. 
we just we just got this this rocket this uh, rocket scientist who's coming in and building all these databases for us right now, so that we can have a touch screen and 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 access our guys on the ground and access uh, our uh, our historical cases that we can connect with our current cases. Like we don't have that skill set here, but people do. I mean, this guy's coming in for six months as a volunteer. He's gonna build it for us. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. And and what I'll add to all of that as well is be willing to talk about it, to, yeah. to raise awareness, to tell stories. But when you're out to dinner with your teammates or with your friends or with your parents, um, as hard as it might be, talk about this. You think about, and then we're not, we're not going to get too uh, political this morning or anything like that, but you think about the energy that we've put into talking about COVID, for example. Uh-huh. Can you, can you imagine, Tim, if the world, just, just give us 30 days, let alone four months, which, which we're at with COVID. Give us 30 days of talking about child trafficking with the same intensity as we're talking about COVID. What would happen? Oh, my gosh. We used to be rescued millions of kids. Millions of, I say this. Remember when Schindler's List came out, probably a lot of your salesmen are younger. But if you in the 90s, 96 children's list came out, <clears throat> and it created this crazy stir. All of a sudden, the Holocaust was back on the map, and everyone was learning, and it was this movement. I talked to the producer who won the Academy Award, Terry Mullen. He said, the only regret was that we made the movie 50 years too late. Yeah. <clears throat> There's now nothing we can do. <clears throat> Sorry. Speaking of COVID, I have it, so just kidding. <clears throat> Um, we got hand sanitizer. We're good. <laughs> but it was too late to do anything about it. But now we're in a situation. But people were outraged in the, in the 90s over the Holocaust because of that movie. <clears throat> Thank you. Imagine, imagine if that movie had come out in 1940. Thank you, Mike. I asked a question when you just asked me, what would have happened? Hundreds of thousands of Jewish people would have been rescued because people wouldn't have stood for it. But the movie came out too late. Right. So here we are in a situation where a Schindler's List, the outrage, right, is happening, could happen during a time while we can still do something about it. And we're getting outraged about all these other things. I'm not saying they're bad things to be outraged on, but I will say this. Can you imagine right now, one in five children will be solicited by a sexual predator before they turn 18. One in five in America, those are the reported cases, by the way, I think it's higher than that. Every 30 seconds in the world, a child is kidnapped. Every 30 seconds for sex, labor, or organ harvesting, okay? Now imagine for just a second, if one in five American children were contracting COVID-19 right now. Can you imagine the outrage? That's not happening with COVID-19. Imagine if every 30 seconds, a child in the world was contracting a serious case or dying from COVID-19. Every 30 seconds. Again, not happening. We know it's not happening. Um, But these things are happening in the world of child sex assault. Which... Are you going to compare between a, 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 a you know difficult a virus that you know kills people that are seventy that are, you know sixty years or older, or a child being raped? There's nothing worse in, in Earth or Hell than a child being raped. I promise you. I've seen it. I've been there. There's nothing worse. Most of them would rather die than go through this. Okay, no outrage, no protests, no news, no marching, no nothing. Why? What is going on? Um, it's, 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 it's frustrating. And can I go somewhere else real quick? Do you mind? Yep. Um, you know, I'm not trying to get political here, but um, we are in a crisis right now with these lockdowns. Um, the FBI in March warned the nation, no one's listening. Local governments don't seem to be listening. But the infrastructure that keeps kids safe is schools after school programs, sports programs. Instead, the kids lose that and they're told, sit in this room, here's your smartphone, here's your laptop, 
do your work, stay here. Me and me and you know me and dad or me and mom have to go salvage our jobs and get supplies or whatever else, right? Right. These kids are largely being left alone. Pedophiles are also not at work. They're also at home with their laptops. And how many pedophiles are there? Millions upon millions in this country. How do I know that? Because two million children are being raped every year by these people. So what kind of demand justifies that number? A very large one. So they're all home, and guess what? They're accessing our children online. That's how they find the kids, gaming with them, Facebooking, whatever it is. Just a few weeks ago, a guy just 40 miles from here, his name was Danny Hardman, look him up. He was 42 years old. He was gaming with kids who were in lockdown at home. Six-year-old girls gaming with them, convinced them eventually, because these guys are master criminal minds, convinced these six-year-olds to send naked pictures of themselves, child pornography. Luckily, the, the Attorney General's office caught him uh, before he got to the kids. But this is what's happening. Now, here's the scary thing. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. There he is. There's, there's young Danny Hardman. Um, uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children reported um, 2 million reports of child sex assault that originated online for, for, April, for, for uh, March of 2020. That's two million more, it's double what it was last year, same time. And then March, it got worse. Four million reports, which is fourfold from last year. What's going on? We're locking, we're shutting down infrastructure that keeps kids safe. And that's not even being debated. Not even and and part the, part, the part that kills me is the CDC has come out and experts have come out, there's no denying this, if you're 60 years or younger, you have a 99.9% .9 survivability rate for COVID. Now, if you're older than that, especially 70 or older, very, very deadly, very, very dangerous. Or if you have like pulmonary issues, very dangerous. Go, we should take care of you. But you take a fraction of the trillions of dollars the government has sent to help businesses, and you could put these people who are vulnerable in the four seasons to quarantine, <laughs> each and every one of them, right? Right. 90% of the people that create the infrastructure are teachers, our, you know, uh, organizers for sporting events, whatever else coaches, it is, coaches, yeah. 90% or more are under 60 years old, so which, which makes us, forces us to a answer one question. What is deadlier? What is scarier? What is a bigger threat to you? A virus with a 99.9% .9 survivability rate or hundreds of thousands, maybe millions based on the reports of children being raped? Think about this. We're not even having the debate. And the answer is obvious, but we're not even having the debate because there's something else going on that are, is, is more interesting than, than worrying about children being sexually assaulted. Anyway, sorry, I'll get off the soapbox for a second, but it's just, we're, we're in danger land right now. And the thing is, is we won't know the consequences for years to come. The lines, millions of lines are out. These, these are just reports. Law enforcement is now told to respond to this, but you know what? They're responding to something else right now. They're responding to another issue. And so they're, they're already super stretched out and now they're being defunded. And again, crisis number two in 2020, these riots. And I'll, I'll say this, you know, I wanna make sure I understand. What happened to George Floyd was 100% illegal, grotesque, and these things have to stop. But as you're having the discussion about all this, bring the children to the table. Right. Let's not forget them once again this year because we already forgot them with the COVID thing. Let's not forget them again when you're talking about transforming policing systems. Because I'm telling you, they're being forgotten, and, 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 and which falls on our shoulders. I know you are. Because we, we have to fill those gaps, and we will. But we need help. Absolutely. Sorry, did I get too, uh, no, it's perfect. did I go too far? It's perfect. <laughs> and I, I believe you've got 2,000 more people that aren't going to forget about them. They're going to talk about it. And so here, here's the deal, team. Um, be generous. Uh, I, I promise you that, that, that Tim and his partners in the places that we put this money, uh, organizations that support and liberate children, um, that, that it'll be well used. Uh, Active has uh, done some things in the past. I personally have done some things in the past. And I know that we're going to, you know, blow by uh, this number, but whatever, but whatever we do out there, Active will put another fifty thousand on top of awesome. us uh, to go towards 
uh, this cause because there is no greater cause. We're about at our time, but I did want to just maybe give a couple minutes for uh, a few questions to come in. So there's a and a it looks like there's a Q&A box. Are there a couple questions in there right now, Mike? Um, let's see. And if you have others, you can either put them in that They're chat right or the Q&A. Um, uh, this is a good question. So, Tim, do you notice a pattern in the profile of a person who is a client of human trafficking, like a personality profile since they're all over the world? Such a good question, and the answer is so scary, and the answer is no. Um, this, is, this is a closet crime. We, you, know, you, you saw that picture of, <laughs> of Danny Hardman, and you think they're all going to look something like that, but they don't. Uh, they look like you and me. They, they are professionals. They are of every walk of life. Um, and so it's, it's, that's why we have to be very smart and strategic in how we find these guys. Um, a lot of undercover operations, both online and physical and other ways to, to, to find it because there, there really is no profile. I think you told me even um, that you or your operators, you might meet someone in Thailand you know, a, a, a consumer in a, in a club, uh, you know, someone that's raping children. And to build up the story, you might stop by their home in Florida. Hey, what's up? We're friends. We met, we met each other, you know, overseas. And these are just doctors and lawyers and yeah. accountants and yeah. just and nor normal, normal people. Normal dudes just traveling and it's crazy. There's a question I saw here, a good one about the, the numbers, the statistics on the yeah. subject. Yeah. So, Refer both. I wrote. I wrote an op. Um, oh wait a minute! It hasn't published yet, has it? Mm -hmm. I have an op-ed that's, that's publishing coming this week. Tell me about your Facebook. Um, what? Oh no, it'll be on your. We'll post it on Facebook then. Yeah. I I, so, but but in the meantime, I'll we send, have we have all the set. I'll stats. send them links to it. I'll send them links. We have all the stats because to, 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 yeah. to write my op-ed. It was just accepted by a major publication. It would come up, in, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. But can you can you post them? I'll put what I'll put. Yeah, I'll just post, post all the sources from my op-ed. And op -ed. I'll post Nick Mick and some other places where they can look yeah. at things like for training. Don't post the op-ed. We'll, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but just post the statistics. Yeah, just put notes. Yeah, the, the publisher will cancel. The There's a few other questions on there, Mike. Pick a good one. Oh, sure. Okay. Right. Let's see. Is there are there actual places where children are being born and harvested? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's it's. There are places where kids are kidnapped and then even bred for the purpose of 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 organ harvest. So why children are so valuable in this market is because if if if, if a child has kidney failure or or liver failure, you can actually use an adult kidney and liver, cut it down, and it's still use, usable. But obviously, you can't do that with a heart. So only a child's heart can replace a child's heart. That's why it's so valuable in the black market. Horrifying. It's about a conservative quarter million of dollars for a heart. So you, 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 you control these kids and you're, you're an evil doer. And there's so many out there where you have tens of thousands of kids to pick from in these countries that have no input. Again, why, why is this a problem in developing countries? Because they don't have the infrastructure that we have slash don't have right now, but we can see why that infrastructure is so important. And in places like Haiti, for example, where that infrastructure is majorly lacking, that's why they're taken so easily. And once they're taken and they're moved 20 miles, they might as well be in China because right. the, the families can't get 20 miles right. easily, right? So that's why it's really easy to do it. So you're one of these guys who has who now has access to 10,000 kids, and you're just like. Each of those kids is two hundred fifty thousand dollars by just selling to an organ harvester, and and the market's huge for it. I mean, if you know about you know transplants and all the ch many children in the world who are going to die if they don't have a heart, huge demand for it. Um, and then those they end up going to you know I, I don't want to get into the details because it just gets sick. But you know how they have to do it, how they extract the heart, and it's just it's just the most horrifying thing. You know, not that children being raped is any, any less horrifying, but the whole thing is just a nightmare. How about one more question, Mike? Let's see what we got. Um, what is required in, in general to be a conductor? Well, we're still putting that, to that, that together. 
But right now, if you just go to sign up as a, as a volunteer, the first thing is you fill out an application. It's not short. Um, and then after that, you, you your name goes into a database with your skill set so we can easily access. Like we might need in Florida a videographer right now to do something. And instead of flying someone out, it's just, hey, we just need to cover this one thing or whatever. So whatever your, your skill is. Um, and then for some of the assignments, we actually you subject yourself to a background check. Yeah. Because we, we can't put you in and with a law enforcement agency, but that's we verified that you're a legit person. So all those things are, are what to, to sign up. And then after that, it's, well, you, you know, you, you're given a mission should you choose to accept. Awesome. I put the join the fight link in the chat. So, so here's the deal. As far as your donations today, um, we will, we will just take them out of your back end. So not going to affect any of your, you know, your upfront cash flow. And so I'm, I'm just going to ask one more time that you push yourself, that you're generous. Um, this, this donation will have zero impact on your life financially, but I promise you that it'll change your heart. It'll change your focus. It'll help you to know what matters. Um, and it's just a cause worth supporting. And so I, I thank you uh, so much for your generosity, for your trust, uh, for your time. And I also want, want to remind you that today, um, because you know we are, we are supporting the 4th of July, because we want to reward you, or we're celebrating the 4th of July, excuse me, uh, we want to reward you for your generosity. You actually have $5 of additional price flexibility on the uh, quarterly floor price. So this is to help you to close a couple more sales uh, that you can potentially donate to uh, this fight. So I just want to give you, you know, another minute, Tim, to say whatever you want to say. And then well, we'll, how do they how, how do they go about doing? They know how to how do they tell you that yes they want. To. There's a, so there's a form. They all have access to a form that they're that they're filling out um, as we speak. And uh, they're just putting their name, how many sales they're donating, and, and Lacey and her team are compiling all of that. So, cool. All right. Um, <clears throat> I just thank you guys. Thanks for you being here, by the way. Um, no, a lot of people don't want to even show up and talk about children being raped and having their organs cut out of their bodies. But I don't know how else to talk about it except to talk about it and tell you what it is. If we're scared to look at it like so many are, then we'll never, we'll never change it. And I think that's maybe, maybe one of the main reasons people walk away from it. It's why they walked away from slavery in the, in, for 400 years in this country, because it's just too hard to look at. We know it's happening, but we don't want to do anything about it. Um, it's with, I, I will end with this kind of thought. It's kind of an aggressive thought and um, it sounds kind of judgmental. But it's just, it's a powerful one. You know, when you look at history and you think to yourself, if you ever watched any movies, Civil War movies or, you know, that, that time period, most of us sit there and go, I know I would have. I know I would have been an abolitionist. I know that I would have not been one of those that just said, whatever, slavery, I'm gonna, I don't care. I, I wouldn't have been me. I would have been standing up. Um, but think about this. You Maybe, maybe you wouldn't have um, because... People in the northern states didn't travel to the southern states any more than you or I traveled to places. Uh, well, not I, because I, I intentionally do, but <laughs> more than they didn't travel to places where slavery exists any more than people today do. You don't see it any more than they saw it. Right. Uh, and so it was just as easy for them to turn a blind eye as it is for us today to turn a blind eye. So just I recognize that like the history books are being written right now 200 years from now where 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 were you in that spectrum were you someone who said i know i know slavery existed but i'm too busy i'm too busy you know sitting in for my yacht Ugh. that's a t that's the <laughs> you you look at people in history like that and say that's not i'm not i don't want to be that guy so but but we have a chance right now not to be those people we have a chance right now to, um, to stand up and liberate captive children. I mean, that's, 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 that speaks for itself. We have a chance right now to stand up and liberate captive children.
last thing, I, I believe I've heard you and others say more people are enslaved today than in the history of, at any other point during the history of the world, right? I mean, is that by far not even close? In, in fact, not to take away from the, the evils of the transatlantic slave trade, that was sex slavery, labor slavery, everything else, right? So horrible, nothing worse. But looking at the numbers, there, if you took all the people that were abused, ensla enslaved over the 400 year period of time called the transatlantic slave trade, which Lincoln ended, but you could take them all up over 400 years and add all of them together, and there's still not as many slaves as are alive right now as we sit here speaking. That's incredible. Over, about, over 30 million people are enslaved. The amount of money that's made every year in the buying and selling of children and women and people is $150 billion. Some perspective. With the amount of money spent buying and selling people every year, you could take that money and you could buy every Starbucks franchise in the world, buy every MBA team, and still have enough money to send every American child to college for four years. That's how much money is being spent on buying and selling people for sex, labor, and organ harvesting. This is a major thing. People think it's a peripheral thing, it's happening. No, no this is it. This is, you know, and just like in 1830, 1840, no one was talking about slavery then. Very few are talking about it now. We need to change it. And, and you guys have the power to change it. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again for your time. And I hope that you go and you celebrate your freedom today um, by working hard. I don't know that you realize it, that we realize that the ability to go out and write your own story um, doesn't necessarily exist anywhere else in the world the way that it exists right here. Um, and so, uh, you know, celebrate the fourth by putting in some time uh, on those doors, working hard. And we thank you so much uh, for your generosity and for your time. And with that, we'll wrap up. So thank you, Tim, for being thank here. Thank you, Vest. Thank you all. Let's, let's, let's do some good, guys. <laughs>